This is Red Podcast, episode 232. If you want to be a better speaker, better podcaster, smoother on the mic, I'm going to show you how to do it. That's coming up. This is the Red Podcast. How to reach more people, establish your authority, and deliver your message. Here's your host, David Hooper. Back when I was a DJ, and by that I mean a DJ, like a club DJ, this was in between my time as a musician and when I was transitioning into the music business. I had a record label that I owned, and I needed money, so I was doing club work, (laughs) private parties on occasion, and I had a booking agent, and this guy was getting me all sorts of gigs, a lot of them weddings. At the time, I was in my mid-20s. I really didn't care about weddings. Didn't see the significance. I was there for the money, trying to fund my record label, get my music promotion business to where I thought it should be. So I really didn't do a lot of the background work that it took to MC and DJ a professional wedding. Let's just say that as a DJ, I had my share of screw-ups. One time I played the wrong song for a couple's first dance. That guy was not very happy with me. Messed up names, messed up all sorts of things. Sometimes I wore the wrong thing. People would tell me that it was casual, and my version of casual, maybe not their version of casual. Needless to say, because of these things, when my wife approached me last month and said, hey, I need you to DJ a wedding for me. I said, what? She said, yeah, my friends are getting married, and my wife... She was a full-time professional photographer for years, still does a lot of photo shoots. And because these were her friends, even though she had never done a wedding, she agreed to do the photo shoot for the wedding. These guys were out of the country, coming back to Nashville, really didn't know a lot of people. They needed an MC, they needed a DJ. She signed me up. Now, there are a lot of things that can go wrong when you've got a wedding, especially when you don't know the people, especially when the entire song selection is in Spanish, all of them very similar songs, and they're handing you the entire song selection on an iPhone, wanting you to hook it up to a Bluetooth speaker. It's a small outdoor wedding. It's going to be loud enough, right? Maybe. I don't know. But I'm the guy who's in charge of it, and I've got to get things going. Everybody's looking to me because I'm also the MC of the event. Fortunately, It went off fine. Now, people ask me, they say, David, how are you so smooth on the mic? They never saw me 20 years ago when I was screwing things up. On this episode, I'm going to talk about smoothness on the mic, smoothness during presentations, becoming a better public speaker, how I've done it, some things that will help you to do it. So the next time your friend needs a DJ and MC for the wedding, you're good to go. This is the Red Podcast. I'm going to help you take your message. I'm going to help you reach, expand, and develop your audience. This episode brought to you by Video Blocks. I don't know if you do videos. You should. It's so easy now. Don't have to put everything on videotape. Don't have to put everything on DVD and mail it. Those are the kind of things that I had to do when I was in music promotion. Wanted to somebody see your music video? Yeah, it's a bitch, man. Had to get two VCRs, wire them up together. Dub those things, it looked like balls. Then you had to mail it. It was expensive. You don't have to do that now. Video is easier than ever to distribute. But the one thing about video that still makes it complicated is you've got to get the footage licensed. If you go to a royalty-free video site, content is lame. It looks dated. It's going to make you look dated if you use it. That has changed. You can get studio quality stock footage for a fraction of what you're used to paying with video blocks. You can download all the stock footage that you want from their member library, including HD footage, After Effects templates, motion backgrounds, and more. All this for just $149 per year. They've got a great deal for you right now. If you go to videoblocks.com slash red, you can try it for free now. No obligation. All the content is royalty-free, so you can use it for commercial and personal projects. I did this to promote my last book. I got some After Effects footage, had a guy put it together for me. 
put a voiceover behind it. It was a great promotion. I sold a lot of books. You can do the same thing. Videoblocks.com slash red has a special offer. Try it free today. Videoblocks.com slash red. Let's get to it. Because I'm doing Red Podcast, because I'm on broadcast radio, because I'm doing a lot of live events, I get a lot of questions about speaking. Common questions that I get, not only about speaking, but about the speeches that I'm giving, the podcast episodes that I'm doing. How are you so organized? How are you so smooth? Meaning you don't hear any ums or ahs. And the answer, at least on the podcast, is that the podcast is edited. That's not a sexy answer, but I work from an outline so the organization is planned. That's there. But sometimes, because the podcast isn't scripted, because my words aren't chosen ahead of time, I make mistakes. And when I do make mistakes, I start that phrase over. When I go back into the episode tape to edit it, that false start, that gets edited out. You never hear it. And there you go. A smooth, flawless delivery every single time you hear it. If you've ever listened to the end of Red Podcast, I've often got outtakes on there. Not as smooth. I make mistakes just like everybody else. But I have had speaker training, which has lessened those mistakes. I started in middle school, took a speech class, started doing speech contests, took classes in high school and college. When I was in college, I did broadcasting and I did broadcasting in post-college as well. Since 2005, I've had a syndicated broadcast show and I've been doing podcasting about as long. That syndicated show I'm talking about It's called Music Business Radio. That is available via podcast. Somewhere in between there, I've had a couple of other podcasts. That's helped me to get behind the mic, have more experience in the studio. I've got a producer who helps me. This is one of the reasons that I suggest if you do a podcast, that you edit your own podcast. It keeps you in touch with what you're doing. You start to get a sense of the mistakes that you're making because when you're in your head, you don't know the mistakes that you're making. You don't know the ums, the ahs, the er, the filler words until you go back not being in your head thinking about what you want to say, but actually listening to what you've said. It's one of the reasons that I keep a producer in the studio with me when I'm doing the radio show. It's the main reason when I'm recording an audio book, when I've finished a book, want to have an audio version of it, and I voice my own books, that I've got somebody in the room with me reading the same script I've got, and he's catching all the mistakes that I made. Because when you're reading, when you're speaking, you tend to skip over words. If you've never listened back to yourself, you probably don't know that that's happening. It's happening to all of us. Let's say you're a podcaster. Let's say you're doing an audiobook, something in the studio, and it's a studio creation. It's not a wedding. It's not something where you're on stage, but it's a studio creation. Why would you care if you've got mistakes? When everything can be edited out, does it even matter? Yeah, it matters. It's going to allow you to give a better interview on either side, because you're going to learn how to be more clear and concise with your message. When you don't have filler words, the words that you're saying are important. And when people know that the words you're saying are important, they're going to be more likely to listen to them. If the words you're saying are important and you're a guest on a podcast, even if it's edited, you're not only making that editor's job easier, but you're also coming across better to the host. When you come across better to the host, more informative, more polished, easier to deal with, easier for the editor to deal with, you're more likely to get asked back. And when you're more likely to get asked back, you're more likely to develop a reputation as a good guest. You're going to be on more podcasts. That's going to get you on more podcasts. Same for your live speaking engagements. When you're a great speaker and people see you, that's going to get you more speaking engagements. So absolutely getting good at speaking It's not the only thing when it comes to the business of speaking, the business of podcasting that you need to worry about, but the technique of speaking is going to help you grow that business almost as much as your marketing is. You can be a great marketer without being a great speaker. You can be a great marketer without having a great podcast, but that's only going to help your podcast annoy people that much quicker. Your podcast, your live speaking can be 10 times more powerful when you're a great speaker. One of the very best things that I've done for my public speaking, for my podcasting, other than just getting up on stage or getting behind a mic in a podcast or broadcast studio and practicing and trying to make myself better and stopping when I make mistakes and starting the whole thing over again, 
is Toastmasters. Now, in this episode, I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of Toastmasters. I don't know if you know any Toastmasters members. You probably do if you're in the entrepreneurial space. But when I think of Toastmasters, and I know I'm not the only one because I've talked about this with a lot of people, I think of a cult. People who are in Toastmasters are crazy about Toastmasters. Have you ever known somebody who they join Amway or some kind of multi-level marketing system and they've never been in it before and their eyes are opened to the power of a big downline? And they're telling you about Amway and how much money you can make. And all you need to do is get three people below you. And they get three people below them. They get three people below them. All of a sudden, you're a millionaire. A lot of groups are like that. Alcoholics Anonymous, you know somebody who gets clean? Can't shut up about AA. He's clean. He's going to let you know about it. Gay people, when they come out of the closet, they get a little bit excited. All that freedom, all that baggage they've had of staying in the closet, that's gone. They're gay and they're going to let everybody know it. Gay softball league, they're there. They become ambassadors. And that's what Toastmasters is like. You get in Toastmasters, you start to feel empowered, join the cult, have a little success, start to tell everybody about it. But strangely enough, even though I'd had that experience, a lot of people saying, oh my God, Toastmasters, it's the best thing ever. You got to join Toastmasters. I didn't know a whole lot about it. So that's what this episode is. I'm going to tell you my personal experience with it. If you're looking to become a better speaker, maybe it's something you'll want to look into. Let's define it first. What is Toastmasters? Toastmasters is an educational group. It's peer-led. but not a bunch of professionals up there. They're people who are just like you trying to get better at speaking. If you can imagine going to a dance lesson, you're trying to learn how to dance, and these people are a step or two ahead of you, and they're telling you what they've just learned, that's how Toastmasters works. It's big. It's international. Four million people have been members right now. There are about 17,000 Toastmaster clubs around the world. Also, this is another parallel they've got to AA. They meet everywhere. They meet anywhere. They meet at different times. Right now, if you're in a major city, there likely is a Toastmaster group that you can go to that's very close to you that would love to see you there to help you get better at your speaking. And like AA, every one of these groups follows some kind of organization to how their meetings work. More or less, every meeting is done basically the same way. There is a system. It's a really great thing if you're thinking about organizing your podcast or organizing meetings yourself because you will see a meeting that is run like a train station. 7 o'clock, this happens. 7.05, this happens. 7.10, this happens. 7.15. It's very organized. They get a lot of stuff done. Starts at 7, ends at 8.30. Starts at 7, ends at 8. Some of the meetings are short. Some of the meetings are longer. I've never been to a club that has a meeting longer than 90 minutes. If you've got 90 minutes a couple of times a month, this is a good thing that you can do to make your speaking better. During these meetings, members take on different roles to make the meeting work. There are three main roles. One of them is the Toastmaster. I thought this was just a name somebody made up, but no, Toastmaster, it's a real thing. That's the person who leads the meeting. There are prepared speeches. These are usually about five to seven minutes. These are usually about five to seven minutes. They're on various topics that have been prepared ahead of time. These speeches, when I say five to seven minutes, they're supposed to be at least five, no longer than seven. So there is a time limit there. Sometimes you'll see somebody who just doesn't give a fuck about how long the speech needs to be. And they'll go on and on and on. That was one of the greatest things that I learned from joining Toastmasters. I wasn't used to timing. I was good at getting that minimum time, but when it came to tightening that thing up and being off the stage within seven minutes, getting to the point, getting out of there, not as easy for me. And you'll see some people like that. They'll go on and on and on. I was one of them. The third part of the meeting, something called table topics. These are 90-second impromptu speeches. And what I mean by that is you get called up to the front of the room You get a question, you get a topic, you have to talk about it on the spot. Depending on the club that you go to, these are things that anybody can answer. A lot of them are kind of boring. What was your favorite vacation and why? What's your best holiday memory? What's your worst holiday memory? 
what do you think about Nashville? Or what do you think about New York? It's an opportunity for you to share an opinion, but it can't just be, I like it. You've got to actually talk about that opinion. And how long you have to talk about it? About 90 seconds. So those are the three main roles, the three main elements of Toastmasters. You've got the Toastmaster, the guy who's running the meeting. He's organizing everything, bringing people up, introducing them. You've got prepared speeches. You've got table topics. And there's some various little things, but for the purpose of this episode, doesn't matter. Like some guy gets up there and he tells a joke. Not important. That's the easy stuff. Those are the beginning roles usually. When people are trying to get more comfortable being in front of the room, they don't want to give a prepared speech. They don't even want to do as much as the 90-second table topic impromptu speech. You get up there and you tell a prepared joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange, you glad you came to Toastmasters tonight? (laughs) Next person. The prepared speeches, the second thing I mentioned, that's kind of the lifeblood of Toastmasters. The topic is anything but there's a purpose to each one. When you join Toastmasters, you get a manual. They call it CC, Competent Communicator, is what that stands for. There are 10 speeches in the Competent Communicator Manual. Each of these speeches focuses on a different skill that will come in handy when you are doing public speaking. So it's not just about the speaking. Sometimes it's about organization That's what I was talking about I had a problem with, getting to the point and getting out of there. I was comfortable on stage. I've been behind the mic for a long time, been doing live event speaking for a long time. But where I failed was getting to the point and getting out of the point and making it a complete thought. So the first 10 speeches you're going to give as a Toastmaster, let me give you a couple of examples. The Competent Communicator Manual, the first one everybody starts with, it's called the Icebreaker. The Icebreaker is more or less to introduce you to the club. It could be a personal story. Pretty much anything goes with this. You get up for five to seven minutes. You tell somebody about your background. For example, I'd say, hey, my name is David Hooper. I used to be in the music business, working with musicians to help them sell more records, get more people to their shows, make more money. I do something very similar now with experts, helping them to get their message out via broadcasting, podcasting, book publishing. I was born in Nashville. I've got two dogs. I've got a wife. Happy to be here. This is a great opportunity for you to go into a situation and talk about things that you normally would not talk about. And because of that, you're expanding your ability to deliver a message. It's great for helping you to get organized. Not only has it helped my podcast, it's also helped me with my book, my blog post. It's helped me with training, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So important. If you just do speeches thinking about that, you will have a better podcast. You're going to have better blog posts. You're going to be so much more organized in your thought process, conversations with your spouse. And there's a bonus. You're not in there just talking to an empty room. You're going to meet a lot of great people, a lot of success-oriented people. There are a lot of entrepreneurs. There are a lot of real estate agents, salesmen, people who get paid based only on commission, based only on their work ethic. You'll get to see other speakers. You're going to learn from them. That's a great bonus. Tell you what I don't like. The thing about Toastmasters is they've got a system. As I mentioned, this thing is peer-led, and the way it works, it's much like the Army, is that there is one system, and they run a lot of people through it. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works good enough for the majority that they continue to do it. One of the things that you're going to see is a lot of people that want to further their training more than just those couple of meetings per month. And for that, Toastmasters has regional and national training. You'll get together with a bunch of other Toastmasters clubs. They're going to put you in a big room. They're going to train you about how to be a better speaker, a better leader. That's a big part of Toastmasters. They say that it is a leadership organization. That's one of the things that they're training. One hand, you've got the speaking. On the other hand, you've got the leadership. Me... As an entrepreneur, somebody who's run my own business, had a lot of employees, you know, it didn't really work for me. There was nothing in there that I can say was worth going to an all-day training from Toastmasters for. Your results may vary. This is one of the things that I didn't like. I also don't like that there's an emphasis on getting people to complete tasks and get rewards. To me, that's just kind of like checking it off the list, and they're not really learning what they could learn from the speech. They just want to hurry up and get through it so they can get to the next speech. 
and then they can get to the next award, and then they can get to another book full of more speeches where they can get through those, get to the next award, complete the book. Seems like it's a never-ending cycle. Just because you get an award or you complete a book, it doesn't mean that you're a great speaker. This is one of the things that, you know, maybe it's motivating for people. I kind of wonder, what's the point? Are we there to get better? Are we there to win awards? My thought is we're there to get better. Each speech that I do in Toastmasters, I'm focusing on a certain thing. And you are evaluated on each speech, by the way. And I'll tell the evaluator who's evaluating me, watch for this one thing. I'm focusing on this. I'm not worried about winning awards. Some people, they're going to play to the audience. They are worried about winning awards. So if that's not something that you like, you're not in the competition, it's going to be part of it. You don't necessarily have to participate, but just by getting up there, you're always going to be participating in some kind of competition. Again, sometimes competition can make you better, but the winner, not always the best, in my opinion. I went to a regional contest, and it was a table topics championship. And what that is, again, is they give you a topic. You have 90 seconds that you've got to talk about that topic. And with the contest, when you're getting outside of the club level, the regional level, the national level, to make it a level platform, you get the same topic. The competitors are waiting outside of the competition room. You go in one at a time. They read you the same topic as the last guy, the same topic as the next guy. One of the things I noticed with the impromptu speeches that were given, as well as the prepared speeches, a lot of the stuff was dumbed down. A lot of the topics, very safe. That's one of the things that I don't, I don't play that game. I'm going to get up and I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. In fact, one time I gave a speech at Toastmasters very similar to what I'm talking about right now on how I thought the competition and a lot of the training and some of the manuals were completely ridiculous. A friend of mine, he's a Unitarian, and I was asking him about what happens at a Unitarian service. He said, well, last week the sermon was given by an atheist. He talked about the non-existence of God. I said, man, that's, that's kind of weird. That doesn't make sense to have a church talking about the non-existence of God. But I guess I was kind of doing that, right? It's using the platform that you've been given to be critical of that platform. I think that's really important when you're trying to become a better speaker, that you take a stand. You've heard the Red Rules episodes. And by the way, if you don't have my list of rules for entrepreneurs— I call them the Red Rules. Redpodcast.com slash rules gets those for you. Talk about planting your flag, taking a stand. We've got enough milk toast entrepreneurs, milk toast messengers out there. We need more people to take stands. I would like to see that encouraged at Toastmasters on the regional and national level. You might find it on the club level. I certainly have. I'll talk about that more in a minute. If you're not finding that at your Toastmasters meeting, Go to a different club and find a club that will support that because that is what's going to make you a better messenger. That's what's going to help you to reach, expand, develop your audience. All the stuff that I'm talking about here. The world does not need more milk toast. We've got enough of it. The world needs people who are going to plant their flag and let other people know that they are not alone. Given the pros and cons that I've given you, is it worth joining? Absolutely it is. If you do it right. Here's how to do that. Make it work for you. If you're going to go to Toastmasters, do it with a specific need. Every speech you give, every time you get up on stage, every role you participate in, ask yourself, how is this going to help me meet that specific need? Maybe you're nervous and you need help with nervousness. You're like me, you need help with organization. Maybe you need help with polish. You need help with the length of your speeches. Maybe you need to expand them. You're not going in depth like you should. Or maybe you're like me, you're going all over the place because of that lack of organization. You need to reel it in a little bit so you can get in, give your message and get out. If you've got a business, if you're having to do live presentations, or you just want to work out material that you're going to give on a podcast, this is a great place to do it. There are ways for you to work that in to any of the manuals that they give you. And the way Toastmasters works, it's a lot like college. You get through those initial core classes, then You get to pick manuals that are very specific to what it is that you want to work on. Right now, I'm working on a storytelling manual. If you want to know how to make these work for you, I'm just going to give you an example of what's in the storytelling manual and what I talked about. There's one called The Folk Tale. My speech title was Las Vegas Hookers. 
let's get personal. That was speech number two. I did a speech called Corporal Klinger. That was about a trans friend of mine. That was a dude I knew in college who is now a woman. The moral of the story, speech title was called Computer Camp, The Touching Story. That one was called Bingo, not the game, but a little bitty dog that I rescued. Bringing history to life, that was speech number five, Marlboro Country. Did you know there was a black Marlboro man? There was. Bringing history to life. That's what I talked about. Black Marlboro man, look him up. Not the cowboy. This was a smooth urban guy. That was when Marlboro was trying to expand their brand. And I gave you these titles to say, you can pretty much do whatever you want within the Toastmasters framework. And you should do that, in my opinion. Don't play it safe. Do something that's going to work for your business. And it's going to let you work on those things that you need to work on. The purpose of this, at least for me, is not to win awards. The purpose of this is to make you a better speaker. So have fun with it and do what you need to do that. Almost any speaking topic that you want, Toastmasters has a manual for you. So get past those initial 10 speeches and you're going to be able to go deeper into the kind of speaking that you want to do. And I want to say this again because I think it's so important. If you go to a club and it does not work for you, find another one. There are several clubs, probably dozens of them, where you live. I got into my current club because my wife was a member. It's a club that started in 1954. It's been going continuously since then. It's the largest in my city. Kind of a middle-of-the-road club. We've got conservative people. We've got guys like me that maybe a little to the left. It happened to work for me. I visited other clubs. They didn't work for me. There's student-run clubs. There's executive clubs with executive-type people. They're for the CEO types. There are closed clubs that if you work for a specific company, it's only members of your company. There are a lot of those. There are religious clubs. My point is, there's a club that is right for you. If you want more information, go to toastmasters.org. Type in your zip code. Find a club near you. Check it out. Give it a shot. It's going to make your podcasting better. It's going to help you with organization. Even if you don't podcast, even if you don't broadcast, even if you don't speak live, if you're writing a blog, it's going to help you with your organization. Definitely worth going to. Check it out and let me know. At David Hooper on Twitter is the best way to get me questions or comments. At David Hooper on Twitter. Coming up, we've got a couple of interviews. One of them is about book publishing. One of them is about planting the flag. You're not going to believe this lady's story. But beyond that, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of these interviews. Coming up, after I publish these interviews, I'm going to talk to you about my pre-interview process. I'm going to let you hear some stuff that wasn't meant for broadcast. The pre-interview banter, how we got to the point where we are having the interview. If you're interested in knowing what I do to prepare for an interview, what you can do to make your podcast interviews better, you're not going to want to miss this one. To make sure that you don't, Redpodcast.com is the website. Go to the top left. If you've got an Android, an iPhone, if you listen via the web, maybe you want an app. I've got them all. Top left. One click is all it takes to make sure you never miss an episode of Red Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Your support means the world to me, and I'm looking forward to sharing some big things with you coming up soon. I'll see you on the next episode. You've been listening to Red Podcast. Never miss an episode. Subscribe now with your iPhone, Android, or via RSS at redpodcast.com. This is Red Podcast. Oh, sh. At David on Hooper. Fuck, fuck, fuck. It's, it's about, to, about go to go. Down. 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 Yes, so down. Yes. With David Hooper. Hooper.